everybody. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everybody. How y'all doing there? I see that most of you survived Christmas. Amen. Uh, amen. It's good to see y'all uh, coming out to worship. A Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're in the book of Matthew. Uh, before we go too far, I did want to just uh, lift up a few uh, prayer requests and announcements. One, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is it for this year. This is it. You know, we got a new one coming up. Uh, how many of you are ready for a brand new year? Any of y'all? Amen. Like, say, say, say goodbye, 2021, right? Uh, amen. Uh, so very excited about that. Uh, in January, we do have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. Uh, I just want to go ahead and throw that out there. Every January, we have our whim, women's and men's kickoff, and we always kick that off with a big fish fry at the end of this uh, January. Always a good time. Uh, and uh, as always, we're going to try to do a, a, a bit of a men's revival at that last week too, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and then hit it big on that Friday. And so Thursday nights, men only uh, at the end of this month. So excited about that. Uh, men, invite some friends with you. It's just a good time to tune each other up and sharpen each other in the Word of God. And so very, very, very excited for what God's doing uh, in our ministry. And uh, also, we're looking at um, every... Uh, I ran this by the deacons er earlier today through a uh, text. But uh, God's lead me to put aside every first Friday morning, about 9 a.m., uh, any men who can, we're just going to have a time of prayer and Bible study at 9 a.m. every first Friday of every month. We're just going to get together, pray, read scripture, however God puts on your heart. But we're just going to sharpen each other up because uh, when men get together and pray, things happen. Amen. And, uh, and we need to see some things happen in our community for Jesus. And at 9 a.m., uh, first Friday. So our first meeting is going to be January 7th at 9 a.m. right here in the back hallway. And we're just going to worship Jesus together. And we, we won't have but maybe an hour. Depends on how the Spirit leads. Amen. Um, and I know that some men work, of course, but uh, this is more for men who are free and who are retired. But we can just uh, come and, Danny, you're retired, you know. I don't know if you know that or not. Amen. I'm retired. And, uh, oh, amen. You know, uh, uh, well, come and suffer with us, Don. Amen. Uh, come and suffer with us. Uh, but uh, we're, we're looking at, at starting that for uh, 2022. And uh, also, for all those who are serving the Lord at our church, we're going to have our next equipping session, uh, January 10th. That's a, a Monday night at 7 p.m. And if you are serving in any capacity, we'd love for you to be there. And if you're new or you want to serve here, we'd love for you to be there, too. Uh, amen. And uh, that's uh, all the uh, announcements I have. Uh, I do have a few requests. I wanted to lift up one uh, for Brett Connor. That's uh, our, our dear sister, uh, her her brother, Brett Connor. Uh, so please uh, lift uh, Brother Brett up as he's uh, still uh, not the best of health or still trying to figure out what's going on. But uh, Miss Norma is keeping us uh, updated with him. And uh, so but just keep him in your prayers. Uh, also, I want to lift up a Miss Sandy. And that's uh, Brother Adam's mama. I want to pray for her and her salvation and uh, her relationship with, with uh, the Lord. And also I want to lift up Miss Kathy Browder. That's uh, Ashley's mom. They, they both lift up their moms tonight for prayer. Um, is there anything else you'd like to lift up for prayer or praises? Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Y'all continue to lift up uh, Brother Mike Cruz for prayer. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Seventy-four years old, right there. Uh, that's not too shabby for a guy that said wouldn't make it. Amen. Uh, so uh, we all praise the Lord for John Jiggs Howard for his salvation and for another year of life. Amen. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Your sister's daughter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Y'all lift up Shelley. My goodness. We'll be in prayer. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. We'll pray for uh, Jocelyn that 
all things go well, and, and that's uh, Aunt Orabel Mixon. Is that right? Or, uh, oh, yeah. Um, yes, sir. Michael. Oh, man. My goodness, so the Garnett family, did I say that right? Um, and Michael, praise report, you're with us. You're a miracle, man. You know, we prayed for you, bro. Uh, so it's, it's good to see you, man. Uh, amen. Michael is uh, on his journey of not just being uh, sober and not just being uh, addiction-free, but uh, Jesus-free, amen. Uh, he, he just wants to be about the Lord. So uh, you, you uh, I continue to lift up our brother here. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, amen. You know, uh, Michael, did you ever think you could be a miracle? Amen. But uh, the Lord saw it. Uh, amen. Um, pray, praise God, man. I love you. Praying for you. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Well, praise the Lord, Michelle. Well, we love you. We're glad you're feeling better, girl. Um, oh, yeah, man. Amen. You know, our church grandma. Amen. Um, what, what else do we lift up for? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Well, my goodness. We'll lift up Ronnie and his family. Uh, yes, sir. We'll pray for him. Uh, what else? Uh, anything else you want to lift up? Yes, ma'am. I'm having surgery on Tuesday. All right. Okay. Uh, amen. Patty will be praying. Everything goes well. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Love you, Mo. Amen. Uh, pray for you, Mo. Uh, anything else? Uh, yes, sir. Amen. 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 I love you, Tony, and uh, praise God, man. That's very good, man. I love you, Tony. Amen. Uh, what else? Uh, anything else? Because he is good. God's good. If you didn't wake up this morning and you didn't think that, I'm sorry, you know, but he is so good. God wants us to see his glory every day, experience his presence every day. But uh, most of us, uh, you know, it might sound crazy. Some of us wake up angry. Have you ever met anybody who woke up angry? You know? You know, uh, that you, uh, and there's some people, you know, they, they went to bed mad. Amen. But God will really take away all of our anger, our frustration, our pride. I, I mean, he really is a source of healing and rest for the weary. Amen. Uh, so, and actually, we're going to talk a little bit about how good he is tonight uh, as we look into our study. And we're going to see a very special moment in the life of Jesus where we see uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all in one place in this chapter in Matthew. Very excited to read it. Um, but uh, anything else? Uh, you ready to pray? Yeah. All right, let, let's pray and jump into the Word of God. Lord Jesus, you are so good. And Father, there's countless times when we are not, and Lord, in which we fail, we fall short. Uh, God, we don't do as we should, and Father, we don't speak as we should. Lord, we don't think as we should. But Father, for some reason, you look down upon your creation, and you love us anyway. And God, that even willing to pay the ultimate price, Lord, that you would give your life for such people as us, 
God, I thank you, Father, that you're the God who will fill us with your life, that you will give us new eyes so that we can see, a new mind in which we can think, a new heart in which we could love. Father, you give us brand new life. And Father, uh, forgive us for the moments in which we slip back into old thinking, slip back into old doings. And Father, you've called us to new. You've called us to be something different, a peculiar people on this earth. And so, Father, we ask that you will continue to lead us into a brand new year. And, Father, that we would experience all the newness that is offered to us from the God of all creation and our Savior. Lord, we look towards a new year and a new journey with you. Uh, God, we want to lift up each request, Lord. I pray for Brett Connor, Lord, that you give him healing. I pray for Miss Sandy, Lord, that she would feel the, the, the power of God all around her. And, Lord, that she might uh, look upon what you are doing so uh, wonderfully in her son, Adam. Uh, God, I, I want to ask that you'd be with uh, Kathy Browder and give her healing. And, Father, just uh, place comfort upon Ashley's heart, knowing fully well that you are the God who sees and you're the God who knows. And you will take care of her. Father, I lift up Brother Mike Cruz. I pray for him, Lord. I pray for his protection. And, Lord, that you'll continue to draw him to yourself. Lord, I lift up Brother Don, and I, I praise you for what you've done in John Jiggs Howard's life. Father, I thank you for saving him, Lord, and giving us confirmation of, of how you're working in his life. And God, I pray that he would just not stop ceasing to, to praise you and give you thanks. Lord, I lift up Shelly to you, Father, as she's struggling with COVID. And Father, I also just want to lift up uh, some of our own church family, some of those in the community that are being affected by COVID right now. And God, that you would just touch them. And Lord, that they might feel your healing touch. And God, that you will get them through this time. Lord, we lift up uh, Miss Jocelyn, Lord, as she's struggling with it as well. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, Michael, and uh, I want to lift up the, the, Gar um, the Garnett family, Lord, that you'd be with them and give them healing. And Father, I praise you for plucking Michael out of the fire, and Lord, uh, placing him in a good mind and a good heart set, and Lord, that he could walk into the faith that you've called him to. And Lord, I lift up Michelle but to you for healing, and God, continue to work your wonders in her life. Lord, we lift up Brother Ronnie Clark and his whole family. And, and Father, I lift up Al and Patty. And Lord, I lift up their health and that everything will go well. And Lord, I'll just echo what Brother Tony said. We don't know why you're so good to us. But Lord, I'm glad that you know why you're so good to us. And Lord, we look towards you doing even greater things for your church. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen and amen. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are going through the, the Gospel of Matthew, and we are now in chapter 3, and we are still in what we would call the first phase of Matthew's uh, call of Jesus, and this is his announcement and his arrival. And so we, we covered Jesus' uh, genealogy, his lineage, and, and then we covered his miraculous birth in which he was fulfilling prophecy and scriptures. Because Matthew's one thing he wanted to make sure everybody understood is that Jesus is the fulfillment and the continuation of God's promise all the way in Genesis chapter 1 where God said, let there be light. Jesus is the light. He is the fulfillment of everything that God ever promised. He's that fulfillment. And so in Matthew, you're going to see a lot of Old Testament scriptures. You're going to see a lot of uh, callbacks to the Old Testament. And I'm very, very excited about this one moment, this chapter 3, because it, it ties so well to all of God's prophetic works. And, and Jesus, he is stepping into that announcement. The, the king has arrived. Amen. And I don't know if any of you were alive during that time when a certain king walked the earth. And I'm talking about the king of rock. Elvis. Any of y'all, any of y'all, any of y'all were alive during that time? Let's, uh, I, Don, I know you were alive then, amen, and uh, that, <laughs> Brother Hans, I know you were there, amen. Now, what, I mean, there was just this hysteria about this one guy that could shake his hips and his feet and play guitar, and he had a really cool haircut, amen, uh, and, and so what, what was the hype about that, you know, because I, I was not even thought of at that time, you know, this is a long time ago, but what, what was that? Oh, I don't think I can say that out loud. No, I'm no, kidding. <laughs> uh, he yeah, yeah, I know. He was, he was gorgeous. Amen. He was gorgeous. What else? He was the king of rock. Amen. He, he was. Uh, what, what else? What, what, was the, what was the thing about Elvis? Why was he so popular? 
<laughs> wait, wait, wait. I missed that. What did you say, Randy? <laughs> All right, yeah, <laughs> he was uh, a hunk of hunk of burning love. Yeah, that's uh, amen. And uh, some of the things that, that, that he wrote had great significance uh, on our culture and, and things like that. And it's hard to even mention uh, when you say the king without trying to think of him in some way, shape, or form in our culture, which is alarming. There's other countries that just find out about Elvis, and uh, in the late... Um, or the early 2000s, late 90s, Japan had picked Elvis up, and it was a big craze for a while. And isn't that kind of weird, you know, other cultures picking up something that was gone a long time ago? And it is kind of neat how uh, things just catch like wildfire. And, and the thing I'll never forget is I was watching a documentary, and literally this guy would walk off of, uh, out of a room, and women would just faint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean... That would only happen with me unless, you know, uh, I was just, you know, uh, I mean, right. And um, uh, unless, you know, I was bleeding, you know. <laughs> you know, that's just insane to think that someone could just walk in a room and it would cause that much hysteria. Isn't, isn't that crazy? Do, do we still have that level of stardom in the world? I, I think we do. It's just not as, uh, I feel, as, as uh, pronounced or, or so zoned in. But, yeah, he would change the atmosphere. He would. Jesus, he changes more than the atmosphere. He'll change the within. He'll change your entire being, Jesus. Because as much as Elvis was the king, he was only king for a short time. And he died. And even though there's some people who believe he's still alive, amen, whether it be aliens zapped him up, amen, or whether it be, you know, it was a big conspiracy, here's the thing. It's appointed for every man to die, amen. And here's the difference between the king of rock and the king of all ages is that Jesus is alive. He's alive. And he transcends everything on this planet. Our, our very uh, calendar system is based on his birth <laughs> and his death. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, if you really think about it, uh, the, the whole world hinges on this story of God's love. And you can look at uh, a lot of different cultures and a lot of different um, stories out there. But it's kind of interesting that... that Globally and through all cultures, we have this idea of, of seeking truth and seeking love. And the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, he professes to be this great being who created truth and love. And Matthew does his best through the Holy Spirit to make sure that you understand that Jesus is the fulfillment and the fullness of the love of God and the fullness of the truth of God. And when we allow this king to be king of our lives, everything changes. Because uh, if we lived in a society where there was a king under us and the king said to do something, what would you do? Well, you probably want to do it. Especially if you didn't do it. Uh, the penalty was imprisonment or death. It, what, what that, would, that would be a bad deal, wouldn't it? You know? So what would really dictate your entire life is how good that king was. Is that true? If it was a good king, well, he might not ask you to do something weird or crazy, and, and you'll probably have a good life. But if it was an unjust king, an unfair ruler, that would be a very oppressive society in which this person could just, uh, it's the strangest thing, there was a time in history when these warlords and these rulers would come and ransack a city or ransack a village, and they would basically take all your stuff, and then they'd have a big feast in front of you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I heard what you said there, girl. And all that. But uh, it, it does seem like that sometimes, that um, the enemy still does that in a way. It'll take all you have, and then celebrate right in front of you. That's what these ancient rulers used to do. That's why that, that Psalm 23 is so powerful when it says that 
of the Lord anoints me with oil and, and I sup before or I die and he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. It has great significance there because literally this person, this king who took over everything in uh, certain cultures, there was this thing where you would have to bow down when they would come by. Even in Roman culture, you would have to acquiesce to them. Uh, the Jews had to carry the Romans' backpack if they asked. That's why Jesus said, if someone asks you to go one mile, go two. He was referring to this oppression that the Jews were experiencing under Rome. That's why Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other. Because more than likely, he was talking to the Jews in which would be struck very often by a Roman guard who had the power to do so. And wouldn't that be the craziest thing if you strike a, a man and then he looks you dead in the eye and says, what about the other one? I don't know about you, but that would kind of like freak me out a little bit. Amen. But Jesus is asking him to choose the path of peace because he is peace. Some of these rulers, when they'd walk in and they'd have to bow down, there's this thing called extend the neck. It's basically when you bow down, you extend the neck, meaning you're giving this person full authority. If they wanted to, they could end you. Well, I want to let you know that we serve a fair God, a just God, a God that is truth and love. And have you reached a point in your life where you can ask this God or tell them, I'm willing to extend my neck to you. I'm willing to bow down before you. I watched a huge youth pastor at this big event stand before all these kids and he says, you want me to show you what submission looks like? And he, he got on the ground and he asked some kid to get up on stage and uh, he asked the kid to put his uh, foot on his neck. He was laying on the floor, this big old guy. And he says, this is submission. This is submission. Now, that, that is such a, like, uh, it was a crazy scene, you know. He was saying, I'm putting, I'm laying myself down and I've put my whole life in this other person to do whatever they choose is right. And there are some people in our lives we would never be able to do that with. Amen. You can never give that, that person that kind of authority, that kind of power, anything, right? Because we have this thing that absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. absolutely. But that's not true. God has absolute power. And he is incorruptible. Amen. Could it be that those with power, just they have all the wrong things inside. Amen. And we need something different inside of us. Something new. Uh, his spirit. God even said to mankind when he flooded the earth that my spirit will not dwell with man forever. His years will be 120. That's what it says in Genesis 6. That basically, that man had gotten to such a point that uh, God, he hit the reset button. And he literally baptized the world. We're, we're going to see a scene where Jesus is baptized. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, about baptism. But there's actually a scene in, in the early scriptures, in Genesis 6, where he baptizes the whole world. Amen. Very, very interesting. Uh, but I, I want to read this chapter and see where it takes us uh, here is our king, Jesus, at his inauguration, I, I would say. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was what? Locust, or grasshoppers, and wild honey. When the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, 
Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not pre- presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will, be, he will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from, from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have what? Prevented him or tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by, by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is the Son of the Beloved, with whom I am what? Well pleased. Very beautiful. Here, right in this passage, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, all in one place. So what is baptism, and why did Jesus get baptized? What is baptism? Most of you have partaken in in that moment of your faith in which you uh, took the plunge in the water. Amen. You know, I I like, and there's some old uh, uh, roots of Christianity where they would actually dunk you three times. One for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They will make sure that you're a different thing when you come out of, out of that water. Amen. And, uh, and some of the ancient Christians, they would actually have baptism where the men would have a baptism and the women would have a baptism. And they would literally, they would baptize you in your old clothes. And upon getting out, they would clothe you with new clothes. Just that symbolism of you being a brand new creation. Amen. What did baptism mean to you? You publicly proclaiming him as your savior. Amen. You, you did owe that. Amen. Uh, what, did it, what did it mean for you? Amen. Like, like a cleansing. Right? Amen. What else? What did it mean for you? Do you remember that moment? You know, uh, I, I was 12 when I got baptized and I really didn't understand the significance, you know. And I was baptized with about eight other people. And I still remember some, uh, some of them uh, and, um, and where, where God took them in life. But uh, I really didn't know what I was getting into, you know. And I've had this discussion with a few people over time is like, when, when was I actually saved? You know, was, was I saved then or was I saved when I had my big, you know, breakdown Holy Spirit is really in charge, and I'm not, and, and God's broken me completely. So I've asked myself, well, when, when did that really occur? You know, was it when I was 12, or when it was this time? And, and I've actually had arguments, because there's some people who believe that you actually have to be physically put underwater and brought up for you to really be saved. And that's not scriptural, though. And they'll try to tie it to some scriptures, but what absolutely saves is our repentance and Him filling his spirit in us, and we receive in his life. Because with the spirit, there's salvation. With the spirit, there's no salvation. Without the spirit, there's no salvation. Uh, it, it's, it's totally not on our works or what we have done or, or who our uncle is or who our mom or dad is. It's, it's all about who he is. Amen. And so when, when we approach this, it, it's, um, it is a symbol. Uh, what, what else is your experience about this? Regarding baptism. Yeah. Amen. Hans said, death to self. There's an absolutely beautiful Christian of a, of a man. Uh, and he said these words. 
When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That sits heavy, doesn't it? This guy, his name was Dr. Bonhoeffer. He was a, a Christian who lived in Germany in the 1930s. He was killed because he was one of the few German Christians that spoke out against a very uh, uh, dominating leader called Adolf Hitler. You know, it's it crazy about uh, Dr. Bonhoeffer because he got a position at teaching in an American college during that time before the war started because there were some American Christians who loved him. It was like, no, you've got to be over here so you can be safe. And so he flew to America to begin a teaching job, but something told him to go back. And he was so comfortable where he was. It's like, I, no, I have a teaching job. I, I can actually have a new life and start a family. But he had no peace because he thought about all those who were actually fighting over there. And he went back to Germany. And you know what he did? Because it was all a mandate that every man join the army over there to fight for Germany. So he went and he joined the intelligence agency and he became a spy. What a cool Christian. What a cool pastor. He went over there and became a spy to save as many Jews as possible. And he gave his life to do that. But he, he wrote a few things. Uh, but one of the things that I always remember is when God calls a man to himself, he calls a man, come and die. Because as Brother Han said, we're to die to self. Right. Amen. To be buried in Christ and to be raised in newness of life. And we're a new creation. Amen. And what, what's amazing is God will change you, but he doesn't change the atmosphere you're in. He might not change your situation. He might not change the people that are in your life. You'll, you'll get saved. You're like, I still have to have this family? I, you get saved. I still have to have these people in my life? Yes. Yes, you do. And now you get to be Jesus. For them. You're going to be the light of, lo of love and the light of truth for them. God will leave you exactly where you are, but he'll change you completely within so that you can set the atmosphere. And you don't have to be set by the atmosphere that is there. When you walk in, Jesus walks in with you. He changes you. When the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, it changes you. It changes how you what? Act. Think, live, be, speak, do, even how you drive. <laughs> Amen. Where you get convicted and you're like, oh man, I, I can't do what I used to do. I, I can't be what I used to be. I, I must be the new. I have to be different. But here's the thing. Jesus never needed that. Jesus didn't need baptism in that respect. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Jesus was set above the rest. Matter of fact, Jesus said about men born of woman, there is no greater man than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. Jesus doesn't fit in the category of the rest of us. But he actually became a slave and a servant with us under the oppression of the law. And the flesh. Jesus humbled himself and became a servant. But he said, among men born of women, there is none greater than John. And here's John, the herald, proclaiming the way of the Lord. And Jesus comes to this man who is, I say, one of the last great prophets of the Old Testament. He's in the New Testament, but he's an Old Testament prophet. Because do you see where he's at? Where is this guy at preaching? In the River Jordan. Do you know where that is? Not anywhere where there's somewhere. There's no great cities around there. There's no great villages around there. Listen, he was in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness wearing weird clothes, eating honey, and insects. All right? And could you imagine, like, him actually praying with you, like, face to face? Could you imagine what his breath was like? I don't know where, like, I don't know what locust breath smells like, you know? 
Uh, but I find it very interesting that he was wearing uh, leather from a what? Camel. I, I just think, I think that's, I'm so glad that Matthew put that in there. He told us what kind of animal skin it was. I, I enjoy that. And it says that he was wearing a leather belt. Do you know who also wore a belt very similar and who was a hairy man? The prophet Elijah. It says that right in 2 Kings. Um, when they were looking for him, they're like, oh, well, what does it look like? Well, he's a very hairy man and he wears a leather belt. And then, oh, you're talking about Elijah the Tishbite. That's who you're talking about. John embraced the role that God gave him with every fiber of his being that he was the prophet that was to come to make straight the paths of the Lord and to preach a gospel that would prepare the people to receive the true and living king, the Messiah that was to come. And the, there's not much of a difference between John's message and Jesus' message. John's message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That was the main point of his message could you imagine going to church every Sunday and that was the main message every time? Could you imagine that? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then they're like, all right, let's have the altar call. Who was responding to it? Who was responding to his message? It, it, it says, what does it say here? Uh, what does it say? How many? Look at verse 5. Someone read verse 5 in your translation. So here's just the most amazing thing, all right? And man, wouldn't it be amazing if church was like this? John preached a message of repentance. And all of Jerusalem, Judea, the surrounding areas, and even as we see the religious leaders who are leaving the temple and leaving Jerusalem to come and see what is happening in the middle of nowhere. And he spoke, the spirit was there, and the people responded. And they responded by what? Repenting and confessing. And it's that simple. Because it doesn't matter how good the preacher is. It doesn't matter how good uh, the service might be. If the Spirit is not there and the people's hearts are resistant to God's Spirit and His presence, nothing's going to happen. Because what if we actually open our hearts to God's Spirit? What if we actually listened and heard what God words, what it says and what it means to us? What if we actually stepped into what repentance is? Because repentance isn't just saying words. Repentance comes from a Greek word that means to change your mind or to change your thoughts. And if you've learned anything about us, it's incredibly hard to change your mind and thoughts. Amen. Matter of fact, I believe that the only way we could possibly do this is to surrender to God and Jesus. To surrender our minds and our thoughts to him. Uh, but here we are, they're at the Jordan River in the middle of nowhere. You know what hinders God's word? We do. If, if there's ever been a spirit or a service or a revival or any type of thing going on in the church... You, you, I think we have commonplace will blame somebody, you know. And I've heard, I've heard it. You know, I've been in this thing for 16, 17 years now. I've heard the gambit. I've heard people leave a service like, I didn't get much out of that. I didn't know what that pastor was saying. You know, and, uh, and you know, that, that's rough to hear, you know, especially if it's about you, you know. And, uh, but uh, we have to come to a place where you're only going to get what you're ready to receive. And if you've placed yourself in a situation, in a system, in a cycle of just always taking and never giving to the Lord, giving your attention, giving your time, giving your focus, giving your devotional life every day, every week, I'm just going to challenge you, if you think that you can feel God's presence in a week where you were kind of uh, oblivious to him, his call, his workings, how he's actually trying to speak to you. And you get to that church service and God was just there and you're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. God, you're all over this. 
I just want to tell you, I wonder how much better it could have been if you brought in the treasures that God brought you throughout the week and that you would bring the crown of life that you experienced all week and lay it at the feet of the king. Just a challenge. Because if, if you don't change, nothing will. If your mind doesn't change, nothing will. Because whatever we do comes from where? Man, right here. And, and Jesus just doesn't want to be the king of your, your body. He wants to be the king of your soul. He wants to be the king of your heart. He wants to be the king of all of you, not just some of you. You know, uh, I think a lot of us are cool with Jesus being king of some things, but not all things. Sometimes we just want to place everything except, oh, except this, Lord. I'll hang on to this for you. I'll take good care of it, Lord. You don't got to worry about it. I know exactly what to do with this. And uh, you can just stay over there with this. Amen? Come on. We've all been here in this moment. And some of you had the faith and the surrender. And listen, the honesty of saying, here. Take it. Just take it. Have you experienced that? Have you been there? Because sometimes what we do is we'll leave it with him, but then we'll come right back and it's like, ah, I changed my mind. Amen. I want to ask you, is there ever going to be a point in which God's going to say, well, you're just rubbish? No. What was that, sir? I don't recognize the problems looking back from the glass, from the mirror. Amen. Amen. I'm still pointing fingers. I'm still playing victim. And if the problem's not right here, then I'm in mm -hmm. trouble. Amen. I, I will say this, because this is rough. John's message was rough. These religious leaders came seeking what all these other people were receiving because their hearts were ready to receive it. And, and John looked at these, like, religious men, these church leaders and what did he say to them? <laughs> this is not some uh, term of endearment. All right. John looked at these men and said, you brood of vipers. Now, listen, that's rough. Because, you know, vipers, they don't lay eggs. They actually birth snakes live out of their gut. That's really gross. But I think it adds a level of uh, intensity to what John's saying to them. Because it, it's not that these Pharisees are just bad to themselves. John was saying that you make more people like you. And what you are is not good. You know, you can make disciples and not be a Christian. There are some people being discipled by the worst way you can be discipled and, and by the worst things you can be discipled because there are many masters out there other than Jesus. There are many sources of authority that is not just and fair and true and good and they will master over you and they will make you your disciple and they will call you to make disciples and more disciples. And some of y'all have been in that scenario. But Jesus, he's the master. John looks at these men and says, you brood of vipers, who told you of the wrath to come because a wrath is coming. You know, like I said, we, uh, and this is so rough. Because look, look at what John says to them in verse 9 and 10. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have what? Abraham as our ancestor. Oh, stop right there. Listen, these men believed they were entitled to salvation based upon their heritage. That was it. I'm entitled to this salvation because I am a son of Abraham. And John's message was counter to what they thought. Because John was saying, no, to be his, you must repent and become his child. You must die and live again in him. That's what John is preaching this repentance. You must change your mind about how you're thinking, how you're doing, how you're behaving. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were perfect. 
They, were, they, they had nothing to grow in. They knew everything. They knew all the words. They knew all the, the, the systems. They knew how to be purified. But they were missing the one thing, a relationship with the living God. Wouldn't it be the saddest thing if you did all the right things except the one thing you, you needed to do? Amen. And that they were missing the bigger part. And so this leads to John saying such a harsh thing here. He says, even now... The axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown where? Into the fire. This is the part we don't like to talk about. Amen? Because there is a judgment. And it is always pending. Some of us, we're walking with a cloud of judgment over us. And Jesus has come to be the wings to cover you from that judgment. He's the only one who can save us from that great and terrible day of God's wrath and judgment. This is just a true thing. And so there are those who think they can see, but they're blind. They think they can think, but they haven't been given a restored mind. They think they're doing the right things, but they're really doing whatever pleases them. Who is your master? Who is your king? Who is the central authority in your life? Because Jesus wants all of you, not just some of you. And that doesn't negate his grace in your life. I want to let you know that. Uh, I, I'm just going to tell you, you're just not going to be perfect. And for some of you who are trying to be perfect on your own merit, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to drive yourself crazy and others crazy. Because what I've discovered is if you're that perfectionist, you want everyone else to be a perfect too. If you've ever spent any time with somebody who wants to make sure that you're doing the right thing, amen? But what's very helpful is you know that they're trying to, amen, right? John, he's so honest with them. He, he said his heart, what the Spirit told him to say, and they, they probably didn't take it too well, amen? Any of y'all ever give news that was true, but they just didn't want to hear it, amen? And they just smiled and say, all right, let's go eat a sandwich, Right? No, they didn't. How do most people respond? What was that? They get super defensive, right? And they immediately lash out. And we've all been guilty of this. And what is so dangerous is we'll actually lash out on some of the best qualities of that person. Won't we? We'll just lash out. But who are we really mad at? You know, uh, I think sometimes we're, we're, uh, we're sorry, but we haven't repented. Amen? I know, I love saying this to the CLM guy. I love you guys. Amen? A lot of us, we're sorry, but what we're really sorry is that we got caught. Amen? <laughs> Amen? That's, that's, that's us, you know? But repentance is not just being sorry, because it says actually in the word that Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, he tried to bring the money back to who? The religious leaders. Because he was sorry. He was repentant in mind of what he did. But there's a difference between being sorry and repenting. There's a clear difference. Which one does God want us to step into? The area in which his hands are shaping us into who he has always saw us to be the person that he died for us to be, the person that he raised up on the third day for us to be, the person that he wishes us to rise up to be ourselves. Amen. Uh, and all of this is centered around this very beautiful moment as John is in his preaching ministry. Jesus steps up. And it's like one of those, I just see this in like a movie where Jesus walks up and John is just like surprised. Like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Because what was John's problem? You, Jesus, you're, you're the son of the living God. You're the lamb that was to come. You're the one who I've been talking about this whole time. And you want me to baptize you? No, I, I should be baptized by you. What are you talking about? Isn't that so interesting? And what was Jesus' response? I love this. Uh, someone read it in your translation. What does your translation say? Okay. 
What is all righteousness? What, what is that? What is all righteousness? The fullness of his measure. The fullness of his will. That's his righteousness. The fullness of what he desires. Man, being right with him. Amen. Like you're on the same page. Amen. And when you're on the same page with somebody, what does it do? Amen. Sister Deb, it makes things go a lot. Do you hear that, Dawn? Amen. <laughs> it, it makes things go a lot smoother when you're on the same page. It provides clarity. It provides oneness. It provides intimacy. And everything that you're trying to hold on to, you can let go now because you can actually trust the one in whom is going to take care of all, all of it, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. God still wants to let all righteousness be fulfilled in our lives. But he wants his measure and will of it. What we want is just some of it and and parts of it. But God actually wants to give us the full measure of his love, the full measure of his peace that surpasses all understanding. And it will guard your heart and your mind. Amen? We are to be living sacrifices. That says in Romans 12. Any of y'all ever come across that? It says, uh, this is our reasonable service unto you. Which we, we will become living sacrifices. And that we should change our minds by the renewing of it through your word and spirit. Amen. That this, is, this is how it, it should be. The problem with living sacrifices is what? We have a tendency to roll off the altar. Because we're alive. And some of us are afraid. Amen. To give him control over certain things amen uh his righteousness still wants to be fulfilled in our lives and we see this beautiful moment when uh what 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 appears in this moment this is like literally a light and a dove descending upon him this is so interesting um what what causes uh, questions or, or comments in this moment or what anything What's on your heart? God spoke. God spoke and said, this is my son, my beloved. Amen. He spoke. He was confirming everything was right. And when we're in a moment that he is deemed right, he'll confirm it. How many of you ever prayed for some confirmation and then there it is? Amen. He'll just, he'll send it. it is, he still confirms things. You know, it's really interesting because a lot of things happen around the Jordan. You know, it was at a small wadi called Jabak, which is a small river that flows off of the Jordan where Jacob wrestled God. And he got his name Israel. Uh, another time is when all of Israel crossed the Jordan to enter into the promised land. And God stopped the river. And they walked on dry ground. And they celebrated and they rededicated themselves to God and claiming the land that they'd waited on for 40 years. Another time, very interesting, at the Jordan River, that's where Elijah was taken up. And before he did... He smacked the river and made a path that was dry he could walk across. And Elisha, his disciple, he wanted to make sure he got the power that he, he'd asked from God so that he could minister as Elijah did. And so he smacked that river too and he walked across it as well. Man, I like that. He didn't have to have high shorts. He could just uh, hit that thing. And uh, a lot of things happened at the Jordan River. Uh, very, very interesting. All of this happened in, in this moment. But something else that's phenomenal, do you, can you remember anything else about a dove in the Bible? Genesis 
Isn't that so amazing? This is beautiful. One of the first times we see a dove is after God baptized the earth. And Noah was on that boat waiting for hope. And that dove came with hope. And in this moment, because God did that because of the sinfulness and the wretchedness of mankind, and then he promised I would never, he would never destroy the earth in that fashion again. He's going to do it different. And he sent a dove again with this hope beyond hopes that he is going to save the world from its sin through his son Jesus. I think it's so amazing how uh, the Old Testament is so uh, in this one chapter. Oh, man, very good, Tony. That, that's, that's that dove who brought that olive branch of hope. Here is the dove again, symboling the Holy Spirit. Uh, because there's always hope. There is. Yes, ma'am. Oh, please. Yes, ma'am. your will that I spend this money and you know let him go into rehab was in Texas I mm. said I'm going to walk outside and see a red-headed woodpecker okay <laughs> so I went and I opened the door and then I said God I don't know if I'm supposed to ask that or not <laughs> anyway I opened the door I didn't even have to go down the steps the red-headed woodpecker was on the tree right there in front of me oh wow and I yeah praise the Lord because Man. I mean you know yeah. he gave me confirmation to give me peace in my heart you know mm. Amen. Man, that, uh, yes, God still sends confirmation. Amen. I think, thank you for sharing that, sister. Um, what else? What else on your heart? Or any questions? Really? Uh, oh, oh. Um, when he got back, when Jesus got baptized, how long had he been doing Well, he hadn't started yet. Yeah, Jesus, this is before he ever began his public ministry. He went through where we see him submitting to his Father in heaven. Why did he wait so long? That's an awesome question. Uh, Patty said, why did Jesus wait so long before he started his ministry? And uh, one, we have to consider that it was the perfect time, that God deemed it. And uh, Jesus, he was, was over 30 at the time we know. And in most Jewish cultures, you really weren't a man of, of stature until you reached the age of 30. Um, also, side note, most Jewish men could not read the Song of Solomon until they were 30, which I think is really funny. You know, uh, if you don't know what that book is, go home and read it. It's really, you know, it's a really cool book. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. Oh, wow. You don't have to yeah. do anything else. Yeah. There's nothing else. All you have to do is believe and be baptized and you're done. Yeah. That, yeah. kind of like, um, I call it the leap. It's like, uh, yeah. God, you go up and you look at God and say, sorry, dude. I'm yeah, you say the words, you, you get the water, and then that's it. So, yes, that still is a prevalent thought in some areas of Christianity where you, all you need to do is get baptized and you're set. You're ready, set, to go. But here, here's the problem with that. And this steams back all the way to the Catholic faith of when paganism really infiltrated the church heavily, where it says you shall not have a graven image. And then they made all these saints. And they even exonerated Mary and began to pray to her, and which is absolutely not biblical at all. And so what we do is gravitate towards the physical and the symbol. Where God, he's asked us that our minds might be renewed. It says in Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. And that's what we do is we, we gravitate to the symbol. We gravitate to the physical and thinking that it covers us spiritually. Uh, 
we, we should walk by faith. I've literally counseled people who were, they were a waitress at a restaurant and someone said the sinner's prayer with them at the table. And when they left, they, they said to themselves, well, am I saved or not? I don't know. Because it, it never went past a doing. It has to enter into being. It's where you have a relationship with Christ Jesus. So, uh, and I actually got in an argument with a guy who said that you could not go into heaven unless you were water baptized. And I said, what about the thief on the cross? And he said, it was raining. You know, and uh, <laughs> you just can't win some arguments with people, you know, because they're so set in their ways. And during the Crusades, that when they didn't have proper nights, uh, one guy actually uh, took a branch in the water, dipped it, and slung the water on some servants and said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, and I'll go and die for your Savior. Isn't that crazy? That's the history of the world right there in which we think a symbol of something means the whole thing. But it's symbolism. The, the, whole, the water, what's much deeper is what God is doing inside of us. That's, that's the deeper part. Uh, we can't look at each other and tell whether someone's saved or not. We can't do that. Uh, there's actually some people who think they can. It's like they wear spiritual goggles where they can tell who knows the Lord and who don't. And sometimes I wonder, well, will I see that person in the, in the, the halls of glory? I don't know. Because uh, Jesus says, judge you not. You know? <laughs> Amen. Uh, we, we can't tell who's saved by appearance. Amen. But it's on the fruit, the trees. And isn't that what just John was preaching about? Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bear what? fruit and Jesus is the true and living vine you must abide in him because apart from him you can do nothing and he wants to birth fruit from you that lasts generations and so I, I would say you know to that thinking that's that's not true it's more about the what happens on the inside and everyone's on their own journey of coming to learn what that means but I think it's so dangerous for us as, as uh, Christians who, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of y'all, like, have, have done this. But what we'll do is, how many of y'all go and eat somewhere on a Sunday after church? Any of y'all? It, it's just, uh, sometimes it's kind of busy, but it's good. You know, the worst thing we can do is treat a server bad. It's like right after you leave church, you go and treat someone bad, you know? And I, I've literally seen this, you know, happen where the, they treat the server so bad. You know, we don't know where that person stands. We don't know what kind of day they've had, you know? Uh, yeah, they forgot your sweet tea, you know? Uh, yeah, they, they might have had an attitude. But you know what? Be Jesus. Extend grace and mercy. But the, the worst thing I've ever seen is, and someone's mad about it, is that someone left a $100 bill as a tip, but it was a pamphlet on Jesus. Could you, I just want you to, like, back up a little bit. You're with this waitress, and you're, you've been doing as much as you can for these people, and you see a $100 bill as a tip, and it's fake. But on it is the word of truth. That, that's, that's, uh, that's not good. You know, it's good that there's truth in it, but the bad thing is, is the, a bit of the deception there, I feel. And there's no representation where the person isn't even there. It was made and, and designed to make someone grab it because, I mean, who doesn't grab a $100 bill? Amen? It's like, oh, that's it. Oh, thank you. They're, oh, very good. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't real money. You know, uh, and it creates a, a deception. Much like the Pharisees and Sadducees, they had created a, a deception about what Christianity, or excuse me, what Judaism looked like, what worship looked like. You know what true worship is? Is surrender. You, that's real worship. Surrender. It's not hearing the best song, it's not even hearing the best preaching. It's really about us surrendering to his spirit and his word. And if you would have a heart of surrender, it doesn't matter what's happening in your life. 
you can fall in the king's arms and he's going to give you exactly what you need when you need it. But it's that letting go part that's hard. It is. Jesus fully stepped into his role and he did exactly as the father told him to and he acted at the very perfect time to act. And so at this moment, we're going to see him step into uh, a battle. Matthew 4 is Jesus walks into a battle, and I'm very excited to jump into that. Uh, but any other questions or comments or uh, anything else on your heart? or my, Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, that's real interesting. I've always uh, settled on it as this. In the flood, ravens eat carrion. They eat on death. Doves eat life. They eat on plants. The raven wouldn't come back because could you imagine what was floating in the water? You know, the raven had all the food he wanted because he lives on death. The dove lives on life. And he found freedom. He found a place to land and stay. And uh, I've always seen it as that. That's a very interesting uh, way of looking at it as well. But there's just such rich, uh, rich symbolism in those birds. And there's some of us, you know, we have a diet of a raven and not a dove. And we need to have a diet of a dove. We need the hunger and thirst after his righteousness. That Amen. Three. Amen. That number three, three times. Amen. Uh, what else? Uh, any other questions or comments or uh, anything? Yeah, yes, sir. Mm. Mm. Amen. Oh, man, it's so much parallels, uh, parallels right there. Oh, man, that, that's very, very good. You know, very good, man. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's why when, um, over the past couple of years, I've really yeah. learned that I know the man can't preach another mm -hmm. man's funeral, you know. Amen, and yeah. We can't say where we're going to go, you know, mm -hmm. one way or the other, and it's not for us to determine. Yeah, a amen. You know, uh, that, that's right. God knows, you know, and uh, what's important, though, is for you to know. Amen. Uh, do you know that you know him? Amen. Uh, what else? Uh, anything else? Um, well, church family, I love you all so much. Thank you all for coming out to worship uh, Jesus. Uh, CLM, we love you guys. Thanks for coming out to worship Jesus with us. Uh, I hope you have a beautiful rest of the day. And uh, Amen. And uh, so cool. And Blake has made it back, and so is your mustache. It's still there with us, man. That's so good, man. Uh, proud of you, Bubba. And um, so well, let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Let Let's, let's have prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for your spirit, for your love. Uh, God, I thank you that you are a God who is there. And you wait upon us. And God, I thank you for your mercy and grace and Lord and how you cover us. And Lord, you've, all, you, you've called all of us to step into our relationship of faith with you. And God, uh, Jesus becomes the model for us in every measure so that we can also fulfill your righteousness. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. amen. Thank you all.